So, hi guys, thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm Enrico Bottazzi, tech lead at Summa, and today I'm going to walk you through proof of solvency for centralized exchanges using SNARK. So firstly, I want to speak about the nature of Summa. So Summa belongs to Privacy and Scaling Opera Exploration, PSC, which is a branch of the Ethereum Foundation that is focused on cryptography and ZK. But actually, Summa belongs to the open source community. So as every project that has been built within the Ethereum Foundation is basically a public good for the whole ecosystem. And we have like a, an open source license, so everyone that wants to use it for any commercial purpose is allowed to do that. Centralized exchange can freely use that. Even startups that are building solutions for centralized exchange can leverage our own backend. So this is like kind of a disclaimer of the net nature of, uh, of the project. So I want to start with these two figures. So maybe you know the one on the right, you might not know the one on the left. So the guy on the left is um, called uh, Luca Pacioli, and he's a Franciscan priest that used to live in Italy during the Renaissance, and he was kind of friend with uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Piero della Francesca, and he's famous, I mean, a bit famous, because he invented the concept of uh, double entry bookkeeping. He wrote a book called the Summa de Arithmetica, which is the reason why we chose this name, where he introduced the principle of double entry bookkeeping. So, you know, like assets on one side, liabilities, asset must match liabilities. And the problem is that this system is basically has some flaws in that, and there are people like SBF that leverage this flow to basically fraud people. And the problem is that like this same system has been used since Luca Pacioli until today. And that's how this book authentication mechanism work. Like you have at the, at the left, you have like one party, which is the company. They build their own book and then they pass it to an auditor that says, okay, yeah, it looks good, it's, everything is okay, and then people, like user, customer, must, be, must trust this auditor that they perform their job correctly. So there are actually two big points of failure in this system. One is on the company side, so they might cook the books, so they might present books that are just wrong, and the second point of failure is on the auditor side, so they might be corrupted or just, I don't know, not good enough to understand that something is wrong. So there are like these two big points of failure that are kind of by design included in this model that is used today. Okay, so that was like kind of the introduction. Now we'll go into proof of solvency as a general concept, not, not specific what we are building. So proof of solvency means generating a cryptographic proof that a centralized exchange is solvent at a specific moment in time. And when I say solvent, I mean that the assets are greater than the liabilities. It's like the default definition of solvent. The liabilities, from the point of view of a centralized exchange, are the deposits of the user. So they might be denominated in every possible cryptocurrency, but the, the important thing to note here is that they do not live on chain. It's just kind of some entry in the database, in the server of the centralized exchange. And Ideally, there, on the other side, there should be asset, so the actual ETH, Bitcoin, that are controlled by the exchange, that are controlled by some wallet owned by the exchange. These assets are the actual ones that live on chain, and the, by definition, they should map one-to-one -one the deposit of the user. So for every Bitcoin that is kind of deposit in a centralized exchange, the exchange should control a wallet with one Bitcoin on that. So if a centralized exchange is able to prove that they are solvent, users are confident they can safely withdraw at any time. So even in the case of like a bank run, they can withdraw. That was proof of solvency. Now get to ZK a bit generally what ZK means. It's like a, a mental model that I think can work, you can help you understand ZK. So I think the first big property of ZK is the computational integrity guarantee. So given a computation which rules are known by anyone, a prover 
can prove that this computation was run correctly, leveraging this proof. So this is a very simple program. In this case, the rectangle in the middle is the program. You have the input on the left, and on the right you get the output. So the pi that you see on the right is like the, the zero-knowledge proof, and just by getting this zero-knowledge proof, one, we can call it the verifier, can verify that this whole computation was run correctly. And the second cool part of ZK proof, which is the ZK part, uh, I mean, there are also other cool parts, but for this purpose, there's the privacy part that like the prover can selectively decide, like kind of tune which part of this computation, which signal inside this computation to keep public and private. So, for example, we can decide, okay, the input X and Y, we can keep them private, and to the verifier, we can only give pi, the sum, the, the verifier will also know the rules of this uh, program, so they will be able to tell that I generated a valid sum starting from some inputs X and Y without having to know which are the inputs. So this is a very toy example, but we'll basically reuse this same model later in the explanation of the proof of solvency. So now we have ZK proof of solvency, we get to ZK proof of solvency with uh, SUMMA. Okay, so you remember like the first, uh, like, um, let's say, traditional book authentication approach at a lot of flows, we want to move to a ZK-based authentication approach. And in this case, you see there's no longer the auditor in the middle of the diagram, but you have this proof pi that is able to tell the users and everyone actually in the world that the book were, were basically accounted for correctly and that we use, we leverage the two properties of ZK that we just mentioned. So one is that the data of the company and, and like indirectly of the users remain private. And the second is that it's trustless. So we no longer have the, this point of failure that we had before in the previous system. We'll go through that more in depth now. How does it work? That is the object of the presentation. The short explanation of how it works is that the, the exchange will basically build this proof of solvency and then they will ask the user to verify that their balances was added correctly to the proof of solvency. So you know that your balance on Binance should be 5 ETH. The exchange will generate a proof of solvency and then tell you, hey, can you check that your balance was correct? So this is in short proof of solvency. Now let's go more in depth into the whole flow of the proof of solvency. These are like the four main steps. If, if, as you can see, the centralized exchange is at the middle. There's some interaction with smart contracts and there's also some interaction with the user. So everything that you see on the user side will be run, uh, let's say, everything that you see on the Alice and the sex side will be run locally. Everything that you see on the smart contract, of, for, of course, will be publicly available to, to everyone. The first thing is that the centralized exchange will build the snapshot. So the snapshot is like the is like a, a, an object, like a container of all the data that needs to be used to perform the proof of solvency. And the main part of the snapshot is the Merkle sum tree. So this is like the a core data structure of this whole proof of solvency thing. It's like a Merkle tree, but it has an added property, which is every time that you go one level up, so every time you perform an hashing between two child nodes, you also carry the sum together to the parent node. So as you can see, you get to the top, to the root of the Merkle sum tree, where you have a hash, which is like a commitment to the entire state of the tree, and the sum, which is the sum of all the entries in the Merkle sum tree. So this is like a uh, data structure that exists outside of proof of solvency. But for the specific goal of proof of solvency, we use that to, we use as entries all the um, user data. So if you can see on the bottom left, username Bob and balance 50, we can use them as entries for the, for the Merkle sum tree. The, this gets built by the centralized exchange, stored off chain, and only the root hash will be public. So nothing else will be publicly available to, to the, the people. The second thing is the proof of account ownership. 
This is not a ZK proof, it's something very technically simple. So the centralized exchange will just collect all their public keys and uh, perform a signature of a message. And they will just submit it to the smart contract that will verify the signature and basically register the accounts owned by the centralized exchange. It's not private yet, but this is something that we want to add to the system very soon. The third part, and here we are getting into the more specific uh, implementation detail, we have the proof of solvency. So this has to be generated only once, verified by the smart contract, and this basically will tell that the assets of the centralized exchange, according to the previous step, are greater than the sum of liabilities as built in the Merkle sum tree. So this is going back to the, this mental model of how ZK proof work. You see that we have, a, we have a circuit. This is how we call the, the ZK programs. The inputs are like the penultimate level ashes and penultimate level sums of the Merkle sum tree. So if we go here, it's like the penultimate level. We just compute the last level of the Merkle sum tree to get the root, the, the root and the root balances. And the, the, the further thing that we control is that, that the root balances must be less than the asset sum, which are like the, the actual balances owned by the exchange as demonstrated in the previous step. So, of course, this is not enough because, I mean, we are basically relying, at this point, we are relying on the exchange to build the Merkle sum tree properly. They can just enter whatever they want, like all zeros, and they will pass the proof of solvency easily. So we need to add a further step to the, to the problem, which is the proof of inclusion. So here is when the exchange will generate a proof for each individual user. So it's like a different proof to each user. This has to be verified locally by the user. And this proof will tell Alice, in this case, that she has been accounted for correctly in the Merkle sum tree as, as committed in the previous step, like as the Merkle sum tree was committed to with the root in the previous step. So this is like um, a very simple zero knowledge proof. is a like a is very similar to a Merkle tree inclusion proof. The only difference is that we also have the sums together in the hashing process, and there's also a very subtle detail. I will sell. I will say that the, com the as you know, like the circuits works in a finite field prime. So if the this aggregated sum overflow the prime, the basically the sum will get back to zero and we'll end up with some liabilities that are way less than the actual liability. So we also need to perform some rain check in order to avoid this overflow on the sums. Okay, so at the end of this point, like the Alice will get the proof, we'll have to verify that the input are actually matching her, uh, her own balance on the exchange and if this verifies, Alice is able to tell that she was included correctly in the proof of solvency. I mean, the main issue in all the proof of solvency protocols is that it's, it's dependent on the user verification. So more are the user that verify the proof, that verify their correct inclusion, more safe and more trusted will be the exchange. And there are like plenty of, uh, I would say, incentive mechanism that can be applied on top of this protocol to actually incentivize the user to verify their, um, their proof of inclusion and therefore basically creating a, a more resistant proof of solvency in general. So these are like a uh, few benchmarks of our, uh, our system. We use Rust and uh, especially ALO2 library for the proof generation. So we achieve a good performance on the proof generation side. And uh, also, uh, an important thing to notice is that since we are using a Planck-based uh, proving system, we don't rely on a circuit-specific trusted setup, but we can leverage an existing setup, which, for example, we used the uh, one from Hermes in our case, which was kind of, let's say, considered secure from uh, the ecosystem. Okay, I will do a demo now. So it's always, you know, 
was working until five minutes ago. Well. <laughs> so the, the repo that I've been using for this demo is this Summa Playground. And uh, if you go inside Summa Dev, the main repo that we use to, for all our libraries is called Summa Solvency. This is like just a simple application for this, for this uh, event. Okay, so let's start. The first thing that I, that I need to do is, is like to, um, to run uh, a blockchain in local. So we are basically spinning up a blockchain and deploying uh, our own contracts there. Okay. This is maybe, okay, it's working. No, I guess this is the Wi-Fi. Let's try again. Okay, I'm connected to its CC. Sorry? Yeah, usually Wi-Fi has internet. <laughs> okay. Mm. That's very bad. Maybe I can use my... No, I, I think I didn't. I didn't pull before. Or give me a second. What? Not working, right? Okay, no worries. Okay, so now we are basically launching our blockchain in local, nothing, uh, nothing fancy. Okay, so let's maybe, can you see that? Yeah, it's, we've been now deploying a few contracts. Okay, so now we'll, we'll deploy, our main contracts is like one contract that is called Summa, that is one performing all the, all the verification of the proof. And then there's the verifier that is like the auto-generated verifier for our specific zero knowledge proof. And we'd also mint some ERC20 for the, for the signer, that is the one that is basically, are like in this simulation, the addresses of the exchange. Okay, so we have the blockchain running. Now we have to, um, to run the CLI to work the old, the old thing. So I want to show you before what are the input files that we use to, to this CLI. So this is, this is like basically a CSV file representing the database of the exchange. So you see username and balance is a lot. And on this side, we have like the signatures. So these are like the fake addresses of the exchange and their signature of a message. So we start the CLI entering the CSV path, this signature CSV path, the powers of tau that we use for the, 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 the trusted setup. This is the private key of the signer, which is simply the one that is interacting with the blockchain. This is the local provider. So now we will go through the whole flow of action. The first one is the, maybe I can split it. 
Okay, I don't want to overcomplicate uh, things. The the first thing is that we will generate and submit the proof of wallet ownership. So you see the the this proof is sent to the smart contract wallet to the to the wallet. Sorry, to the smart contract, and these are like the attested addresses of the centralized exchange. Now we'll generate the proof of solvency. So this is actually a, a zero knowledge proof sent to the contract. You see now the contract, only at this time, the contract will actually fetch the balances of the exchange at this block and compare it to the sum as according to the Merkel sum tree. So this is the, um, the proof that I think yeah, now is fetching the balances from the ERC20 contracts. And now we'll, we'll work, we'll work. Yeah, as you see, like the proof is very fast. Like the, the, the time is actually more about fetching uh, balances from other contracts. So the submit proof of solvency was called and, uh, and verified. So now we have the only, the whole on-chain part is finished and we go through the proof of inclusion. So the part where the exchange generates a proof for each individual user. So now the exchange will basically need to enter an index which is the identifier of the user in the CSV file. We'll choose zero. We'll create the proof. We'll save the proof to a file. And then that's the verification part. So in the, let's say we generated this proof, we pass it to a user, and then this user has to verify it. So first of all, we need to okay, input the file name, then the root hash, because this is a public input of the proof that we need to verify against. We need to make sure that this root task is matching the one that is published, committed, committed in the smart contract. And then we need to enter the username. So we say this user zero. This is the username. This is the balance. The balance of, because we are doing this for two assets, but actually we can support any number of assets in the proof of solvency and any type of asset actually. And yeah, basically the proof has been validated. So you can run this demo with any CSV file, any type of number of assets, any number of signature, and this will work. So I think we have, yeah, just want to finish very quick and then pass to if you have some question. The next steps as we want to add privacy, we want to add instant finality, but maybe we can speak about this in a separate place. I want to thank my teammates, Jean and Alex, that are working with me at this project. I didn't have a photo of them, unfortunately. And uh, the last thing I want to leave you to this link. On the left, you see all of our repo, and on the right, a Discord channel where, it's not our Discord channel, it's actually a general proof of solvency Discord channel where research and everything happen. So, question? So the off-chain snapshot has a different timestamp with your on-chain queries. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, you're, it's a very good point. Like the, the proof of concept that we deploy right now is, is basically there's like some latency between the two of them. And the, the idea that we want to implement is basically allow the smart contract to access historic data and we are working on an implementation with Axiom on that, that can actually allow us to access data on some previous blocks. So you can prove that you control some balance at, I don't know, one year ago, basically. But yeah, it's a good, good point. Could you tell us more about the incentives uh, for the user when they are asked to ask for the proof of inclusion? Yeah, 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 good one. So for the way we designed the protocol, we don't want to be the ones enforcing the incentives mechanism. It's, I think it's more on the centralized exchange side to be the one deciding for these incentives. But I think there are like some natural incentives that if you have a lot of money in an exchange, you will be incentivized to 
verify, but there might be some incentive mechanisms such as some lotteries or some, some just like some prize that you give to anyone that performs this solvency verification, some inclusion ba basic verification. Stuff. Thanks. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.